It's uh, a real privilege and very great honour to be the guest speaker tonight and to have all these wonderful things that Mark has arranged, which you've just been watching. I'd like to thank him very much and the, uh, uh, the lovely interviewer who made so much of it for me. I'm enormously grateful to her. And uh, one of the things I, I just want to uh, share with you as we think about Halloween is a uh, uh, little poem that uh, I wrote some years ago, which is called Halloween Greetings. Greetings we bring for Halloween, the time when strange things can be seen. Zombies wail sadly through the doors while monsters sleep on bedroom floors. Vampires fly over graveyard mud in search of some refreshing blood. Wizards and witches comb the skies looking for victims to surprise. And while there is no need to fear them, my best advice is don't go near them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, just to a short piece that uh, I'd like to say. At 87, the memory isn't quite as it used to be at 27, and uh, the some of the spontaneity has deserted me, so that I have to uh, rely on my notes. So if you'll forgive me for reading little bits from here and there. Um, this is a piece about Halloween and what it seriously is. Technically and historically, Halloween is the Vigil of Hallowmas, which is All Saints Day, celebrated on November the 1st. Pope Gregory III, whose papacy lasted from 731 to 741, and I'm so tempted to say AD, when we now have to say something like CE, and anyway, Pope Gregory III instituted it, when he dedicated a chapel in the St. Peter's Basilica to all saints. Gregory IV extended the idea to the entire church in the year 834. But there's only a thin roll of Christian wallpaper sliding around uneasily over these rugged old pagan foundations that go back thousands of years. When the age-old Halloween customs are analysed, we find traces of the sturdy old Roman festival of Pomona, <coughs> bits of mystical druidism, ancient harvest and fertility magic, old agricultural rites, and lots more fun and games. The Celtic year ended on October the 1st, 31st, which was the eve of Samhain, and was another traditional excuse for lusty rural celebrations. The Druids saw it as the end of the summer and a kind of special festival of the dead. And departed spirits were thought to come back to visit friends and family who'd been left behind on earth and to get a little cheer and comfort before facing the long, bleak winter of the spirit world. It was also the day when corn was thrashed out and food was prepared for winter storage. Probably because the ancestral ghosts were believed to be hovering amiably around, it was also considered to be an ideal time for prophecies and divinations of various kinds. Well, just using that as a, an introduction to the history of Halloween, I'm very interested as a, a writer of the paranormal and a, a maker of shows on the paranormal to find out why it is that people in general are so interested in the paranormal and I'd like to read you a couple of lines for this article that deals with that topic of why we're interested in the paranormal. 
And I said this in the article, thinking people are fascinated by the unsolved and the mysterious. In a world where dull routine can take the flavor out of life and stress can make life almost unbearable, then examining the paranormal gives us an opportunity to escape. Trying to solve the unsolved is a much needed mental holiday. And death is a dark shadow that hovers on the horizon of the healthiest and happiest people. Unsolved mysteries and the paranormal, especially ghost stories, indicate that life goes on beyond the grave. And that helps us to drive the shadows back. It's part of our human nature to be curious, and inquisitive, and unsolved mysteries and investigations of the paranormal help us to satisfy those instincts. Human beings are always craving for something different, and exploring the supernatural realm can help us to find strange things that are very different. If we think about problem solving, from crossword puzzles to detective stories, problem solving intrigues everyone. And the paranormal provides the most intriguing problems of all. So the paranormal world, with its dragons and giants and leprechauns and all the other gang, offers unusual magical powers and people <coughs> are intrigued by power. Now I wanted to talk about one or two unsolved mysteries and as we talked about the Oak Island mystery with that mysterious um, shaft uh, I will shorten what I wanted to say about it, as you've had all the background to it, that uh, when Patricia and I were over there, and we met Dan Blankenship, and uh, got on very well with Dan, he was a wonderful bloke, and I have actually stood with Dan arm's length away, looking down this 90 foot, 100 foot hole, and as I talk about it, with you now tonight, what is at the bottom of it? Well, there's the old pirate treasure, but that hole probably goes back a long time before Captain Kidd set sail. And the, the mystery of it is, imagine what it's like with no mechanical aids, because that was dug way back when all you had was a spade and a pair of strong arms. How did they get that thing down there, 100 feet and more? Why did they do it? What's at the bottom? And all sorts of fascinating theories have come up over the years. And one of the most fascinating let us mix our mysteries theory <coughs> is that it was something extraterrestrial. That somebody had come from a distant planet, from a distant galaxy, perhaps even from a, one of the multiverse parallel universes, if there's any truth in that theory. And they had had something so vitally important that they didn't want our primitive ancestors to mess about with it or damage it. And they dug this enormous hole. And of course, if they were extraterrestrials, they would have been very advanced and they would have had the machinery with which to do it. And the next mystery that uh, I wanted to just mention in the talk tonight, and uh, I'm going to call upon my good friend Mark to time me and give me a wave when I'm getting to the end of it, right? Um, done so much to help me, marvellous bloke, like him very much. <laughs> so, um, 
This is the, uh, the mystery that I wanted to share with you, or another of the mysteries that I wanted to share with you. Way back in the 18th century, in fact, in the year 1784, the Bishop of Norwich had a son, and this was the third son that the Bishop had had, and he grew up, Benjamin Bathurst his name, to become a member of our British diplomatic service and served very well in our diplomatic service until November the 25th in 1809. He disappeared in a completely unexpected and mysterious way. He was in Perlberg, Germany, and had been staying at the inn. This was at the time when the Napoleonic Wars were raging, and decided that it would be safe to leave Perlberg as soon as possible and to go back to the, the route on the main road back towards Britain. He called for his assistant to bring the horse and carriage. The assistant duly went to fetch it. Ben is still in the pub in Pearlberg where they'd spent the night. The horses and carriages duly, or I can use the table as, a, as an illustration. The horses and carriages duly came to the front of the inn. Ben Bathurst came down the stairs, walked around the heads of the horses, his assistant is standing there with the door open. Yes, master, come this way, or that sort of thing. <coughs> and Ben wasn't there. Now, if you can imagine, there's this Pearlberg Forest, which is, we say, in the model I'm building, is where you, my friends in the audience, are sitting. This was the inn, and Ben came down the steps. The horses were here. In order to get to the side, he walked around the head of the horses towards the woods and was never seen again. So what happened to him? Did he fall into the hands of a patrol of Napoleonic troops who were hiding in that wood? And zonk, he's gone. But there was no sound. There was no flurry of movement. There was nothing except Ben coming down from the inn, round the head of the horses, and gone. <coughs> it's a story that I find among all the unsolved mysteries we've ever explored, one of the most intriguing and mysterious. And we make sure we get the next set of notes as is. Part of the problem of being 87. Ah, yes, the next one I wanted to talk to you about, because uh, we got involved with this in a big way. I don't know how many of you have come across the mystery of the uh, possessed Ford Capri, <laughs> the one that has the number plate ARK666, and then a letter Y at the end. <coughs> And of course, we all know from our knowledge of the paranormal that 666 was the so-called mark of the beast. And uh, it was the thing that <coughs> Alistair Crowley, when he was alive, used to call himself 666 as part of his sinister persona. <laughs> and the, uh, the car with the ARK 666 number plate, as it was a Capri, um, belonged to Keith Tagliaferri, whom we met because we wanted to examine it. And being the bloke I am, I said to Keith, can I drive it? <laughs> yes, he said, certainly. And we took it deliberately along the road at the top of Beachy Head. <laughs> and I was more or less saying to anything that might have overtaken the car, if it had anything nasty living in it, <coughs> You take me on, mister. 
and I will exercise you so ferociously that you'll finish up on another planet. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, it behaved itself perfectly normally, and I drove along this road by the top of, uh, I said, Beachy Head, with my fearless little wife in the back, and uh, we all looked at each other and said, can you feel anything? No, I said, nothing. I said, neither can I. But the number of people who have asked um, our friend Taglia Ferry, could we drive it? Could we sit in it? Could we touch it? Who then say they felt all sorts of things like electric shocks or you know, waves of strange energy coming out of this old Ford Capri. And uh, anyway, it's still on the go. And uh, as it didn't drop us off the top of Beachy Head, we're still here to talk about it, but I felt absolutely nothing. And neither did Patricia. But, uh, there are a great number of people who I can only assume are far much more sensitive than we are, who drove the Ford Capri and felt that all sorts of bogey men were coming out of the carburetor. <laughs> and uh, so we've uh, already talked about the, uh, in the course of the, the documentary, which I'm, again, so grateful again to Mark for the wonderful job he made of that. The, uh, the, uh, another mystery that uh, I didn't uh, talk about in that documentary was the uh, mystery of Renault Chateau. And I just want to read you some of the facts about the Renault Chateau mystery. Berenger Saunier was born on April the 11th, 1852. He became a priest and was appointed to the living of Rennes Chateau on June the 1st in 1885. Shortly afterwards, Saunier seems to have gained access to substantial sums of money, which he spent <laughs> lavishly and ostentatiously until he died on January the 22nd, 1917. There are several legends, some of them of considerable antiquity, surrounding the source of that mysterious wealth which he came into. And if we adjust the old adage about thieves being adept at catching other thieves, perhaps a priest has a better chance than most of getting inside the mind of another priest, even when their worlds are separated by a hundred years and ten times that number of miles. Sonnier's mind, however, seemed to be about as accessible as Force Knox. He was born in the hilltop village of Montezel, narrow three-storied house with iron verandas, a house which still overlooks the strange 17th century Fountain of the Tritons. Uh, these same Tritons feature prominently in one of the mysterious Merovingian legends, which we would need to examine further. Sonia's parents were staunch royalists at a time when republicanism was predominant in France but there may have been more to their political allegiance than simple party preferences. As a child, so the longest memories of the village relate, Sonia would say to his young companions, let's go up into the hills and hunt for the lost treasure of Renle Chateau. It would seem to suggest that his parents had given him some inkling that a legendary treasure existed in that vicinity. And had it been whispered to the boy that he had more right than most to that treasure, did the elderly Sonniers actually believe that they were descended from an ancient royal line, of the ostensibly defunct Merovingian dynasty? So there we have the outline of the Berger-Saunier mystery. 
that he became immensely rich, immaculately rich. And nobody knows what he found or who had put it there in the first place for him to find. And we have spent a lot of years examining, been down to Rennes Chateau, and uh, never got any further with finding it than any of the other treasure hunters who tried for it. Now, I'd like to finish the Unsolved Mysteries part of the talk by sharing with you the most, with all the things that Patricia and I have investigated, the single most surprising, mysterious thing that ever happened to me. I used to work at Gamling Gay Village College over in Cambridge. And on the staff with me, and I'm going back a long way there, this was, this was back in the 60s when I was the further education tutor at Gambling Gay Village College. Now the Cambridgeshire Village Colleges operated on a system where you had a, a, a warden in charge of both the day school, which was a normal secondary day school, and all of the evening activities, which were um, evening classes, evening education, and all the youth clubs. And when I was uh, appointed there as the further education tutor, I became a great friend of the science master, and we remained friends for the rest of our <coughs> shared lives. His name was Bill Farrow, and even after we'd moved on through various teaching posts and come over here to Wales when I got the headship here, um, Bill and I kept in touch, and then I got a very sad impact one morning when he phoned me to say that he'd just got back from the doctor from the hospital and had been told that he had about six weeks to live. And I said, Bill, I'll come over every weekend while you're still here so we can be together as much as we can. And every weekend I'd finish work here in Cardiff, drive over to Cambridge where Bill lived. And sure enough, the prognosis was absolutely right. Six weeks almost to the day, Bill passed over. Now, in the course of going over to see him again, and I said we'd been very close friends, thought the world of him, the local vicar who had been in the village where Bill spent his last days, <coughs> Father Ian his name was, asked me if I would come over and conduct Bill's funeral because it had been Bill's last request that I would go over and yes, of course I will. And he said, well, I've got it fixed up for Friday week and can you come over on Thursday night and we'll go through the way we'll run the service together. So I said, yes, yeah, sure I will. So having done a day's work in Cardiff first, I drove over um, to just outside Cambridge where this little village was and it was then almost midnight. Ian and I, if you can imagine two priests with Bibles and prayer books open, I'll read this, you read that, I'll read that bit, you do the next bit. And suddenly, <coughs> I saw Bill. He looked as real, as solid, as human, as he had done 50 years ago when we met. And he was radiant with happiness. It was, it was coming off him almost like light. And Ian could see and hear nothing. Bill looked in his late 20s, early 30s, as he had been when we first met, when we were teaching together at Gambling Day. And he said to me, tell Ian, who you remember could neither see nor hear him, tell Ian that Saint Juliana was absolutely right. And then he vanished. And I thought, here I am with another priest. It's almost midnight. 
We're working out a service for tomorrow morning. What on earth will he think if I say, oh, by the way, Ian, I've just seen Bill's ghost. <laughs> and then I thought of it this way. If it had been the other way round, Bill and I had been so fond of each other that if I was the one who died, he would undoubtedly have done what I asked him to. And I thought, I must not let him down. And I said very hesitantly and nervously to Ian, Ian, I'm terribly sorry about this, but I have to tell you, and I'm sorry if it makes you think I'm a total idiot, but I have just seen Bill's ghost. He looked wonderfully happy, he looked about 25 or 30 again, <coughs> and he asked me to tell you that Lady Juliana, St. Juliana, was absolutely right. Now, I had expected almost any sort of response from Ian that he would have said, no idea what that could be. I said, I, I don't believe in you know, don't believe in ghosts. I imagine you're, you're just imagining it. But he didn't. He very nearly collapsed. He went deathly white and finally said, You can't have known that. <laughs> now I am intrigued. What can't I have known? And when he'd recovered, Ian explained. He said, I was with Bill in the hospital <coughs> as he was taking his last few breaths, just the last few minutes before he passed. And he said, the last thing I said to Bill was, Saint Juliana said, after her spirit had made a visit to heaven, she came back and said to the other nuns in the nunnery, who were very worried about her because she'd apparently just fainted. She said, no, I'm not ill. I've been to heaven. I've seen paradise. I've seen the future life. And then she went on to tell Ian, in her words, which I quote, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And he said, you've just driven 300 miles to tell me that Bill has come back to tell you to tell me <laughs> that Juliana was absolutely right and he's having a wonderful time. <laughs> well, we were both absolutely dumbstruck. And finally, Ian said, I think that a nice cup of coffee and a liqueur would do us both good. <laughs> <laughs> and he very kindly laid it on. Well, I shall be very, very happy to answer any questions that any of you have. And... Uh, do feel so welcome if anybody would like to ask me anything or make a comment you know I'm delighted to be one of the group and I again I feel so honored that so many of you wanted to come tonight I really have it's made it's made my Halloween <laughs>